You're listening to The Big Lift, the podcast of Web Trends Optimize, the CRO solution that enables marketers and developers to maximize the ROI on their digital properties. Web Trends Optimize is a powerful, feature rich, and easy to use solution, all delivered within a fixed price contract with no additional cost for increased functionality ever. During these podcasts, we meet some of the key influencers within the marketing and conversion world to understand their roles and examine their challenges. Welcome to the first episode of the fifth series of the Big Lift podcast. I can't believe we're already in our fifth series. The years have flown past. Today, I'm talking with Johan van Tonder, CEO at AWA Digital. Johan has 15 years of optimizing online sales and is a self-confessed data geek. We discuss why CRO should be seen as a strategic part of commerce rather than a tactical way of generating more revenue and why it should reflect business goals more rather than just concentrating on improving customer experience. Johan, I noticed on some of your LinkedIn posts that you've come out with a phrase that CRO sucks if it's not strategic. Now that's a big statement to say the least. So first of all, I'd like to find out what makes you think that you're qualified to make such a statement. And secondly, what do you think that means for the layperson out there who's been working hard doing lots of uh, lots of CRO? Ooh, well, there are a couple of questions in there, and they're all very controversial, and I've got to deal with them separately. Let's start with the one, the, the part B to that question, what makes me qualified? I'm not qualified at all. I just have an opinion. I've been doing this for 20 years and I'm still trying to figure it out. And that's the reality. I'm not just saying that because it sounds nice or it's, it's become a bit of a cliche. If I look at the work that I did two years ago, I'm embarrassed. If I look at the work that I did five years ago, I cringe. I, I, I'm, I, honestly, I mean that. And here's the thing. Two years ago and five years ago when I did that work, I thought I had it all figured out because by then I had 10 and 15 years experience in this industry and I had a team of people around me and I had results to kind of validate just how great I am. (laughs) And I'm now 50 and I can tell you this, that it's all bullshit. When you think you have it figured out, you're in trouble, you don't. Now to get to the second point, um, about so so that to be fair, I didn't write that um, that statement. CRO sucks, but I agree with it. I agree with it. I I think that w- what CRO has exploded, and that's great. So in the last ten years, so CRO started becoming a thing around twenty ten or so. Okay, I, I I was a I was a beta user of Optimizely. This is back in twenty ten, and so that's really when things started becoming official. I guess. But what I'm seeing today, the mistakes being made, are the same mistakes that we made back then. Except I don't think there is an excuse anymore to make those mistakes because others have made them on your behalf and you can learn from them. But, but no can reason. I just interrupt there? Well, can yeah. I just interrupt? Yeah, yeah. Because, yeah, I agree with you. They're making the same mistakes, but they're their mistakes. They're not your mistakes. They're the same mistakes, but they're living in a different world and a different experience, surely. I accept that. But I think the entire experimentation mindset and growth mindset, one very important part of that is learning from not just your own mistake, but the mistakes that others have made. And there is what what I'm the point that I'm trying to make, John, is that 10 years ago, there was no blueprint. There were no blog posts. There were no books. You had to figure this stuff out yourself and Mm -hmm. you had to kind of you know, stumble over your own, own awkwardness and, and lack yeah. of knowledge. But, but that, that's, it, it doesn't have to be that way anymore. Um, and, and then the last part to my answer is this, that what it means is that CRO in large has become what I characterize as moving shit around the page. <laughs> and that's, that's if, if you look at most CRO today, that's what it is. That is not CRO. That's the antithesis to CRO. And so I would say, I agree with that statement, even though I didn't write it, CRO sucks when it's not strategic. You waste a lot of money. You, uh, if, if I were a business owner, 
I would not spend money on, on that kind of CRO because it's a, knowing what I know now, it's a sure way to waste a lot of money. So I, I get that uh, because you've got hindsight experience. You've done all this. You kind of know what's, what's out there. And there is a lot of, as you say, resources out there. But if I look at the world of YouTube or whatever it is, it's very difficult to get a definitive, this is how you do it. There are lots of people who think they know what they're talking about and come out with mm. great YouTube content, but it's their way of thinking how to do it. And it's it's a minefield. Is it? Do you think it's down to the fact that there isn't a prescribed education about CRO? So, for instance, if you go to university and you go to a marketing degree or you do an analytics degree, there isn't a path to follow in that. And so, therefore, people are learning the way they do it from other people who have done it badly in the past. Um, I don't think it's that. I don't think that's... I, I, if, if only people were learning from others who have done it badly in the past, but that's not what's happening. I'm fairly active on Twitter or, or X, if you insist, and you can see what's happening there. You can see that's where the... I, I like Twitter or X because that's where the new generation hangs out because it it gives you a view on what is to come and you know how how things are, are, are changing. And what I'm observing there is... A lot of young energy figuring this out by themselves, and they seem to insist to do it that way. And I think it's crazy. I think it's absolutely crazy. Now, they're, they're, it's it's more nuanced than this because one, I acknowledge it is incredibly arrogant for me or anyone else to say, "Here's the right way of doing CRO, mm-hmm. and here's the wrong way of doing CRO." You know, that that's arrogant, and I, I get it. Um, but when it comes to something as black and white as statistics, for example, there is no gray. And, and often that's what I base my judgment on. You know, it's, you've, you've got to have a clue. Unfortunately, it, what we do is governed by the laws of statistics. And so you've, you've, you've got to have a clue, more or less, what's, what that's about. And you can't make it up. That's the bit you can't make up. So I think there's... Um, while there are areas that are perhaps more open to interpretation, and, and I think that's good because different ways of doing things might even give you a bit of an edge. But there, at the same time, there are certain laws that have to be respected, and that's not the case. But again, I'd go back to is that education because I would say, and this is a, a, a wild statement to make, but lots of people do CRO because they think it's something they should be doing. And are not, and I use the mm. word quali- qualified um, very reasonably because I think they're not qualified in statistical analysis. They're marketers who have got an idea who want to be able to say, oh, look, we can improve this. I've heard a great deal about CRO. So they're not mathematicians. They're not people that look at data analytically, like somebody who has done a maths degree or a, you know, a physics degree. They look at things and saying, OK, how can I make the customer experience better? So do you think it's that that's where we fall into this? I'm trying to do my best, but I'm not really qualified for doing this because I don't know the analytical stuff. I would be really I, I, the, the you're not qualified is not my words. I don't think I don't think you have to have a math degree or PhD in physics to be able to do this. In fact, you'd probably be overqualified and get bored. I've seen that as well. But you you've got to do some self-study then if if nothing else now you you raise an interesting point there and i think there's a lot of truth in that so our senior stakeholders for example they just care about the result they care about the decision should i do this or should i not do this mm-hmm. and they look to you to advise them on what that decision should be what is the right choice yep and they don't care about the 95% statistical significance and P and, and, and all this stuff that, you know, the, the, the geeks love talking about. But somebody has to. Somebody has to because it, it, it does come down to that. Um, the decision is at least informed by that. And, you know, you've, you've, you've got to have... If you, for example, what I see, again, going back, I'm trying to think of, of 
real life examples to color this in what I'm what I'm saying, and I'm going to go back to X. So I see case studies on X, for example, frequently, where a winner was called after two days, where you've got maybe fewer than a hundred transactions on either variant. There's absolutely no way. There, there is just absolutely no way that decision can be made. And even though your senior stakeholder doesn't care about the stats and you shouldn't overwhelm them with the stats, at least you should have the baseline knowledge to know this is bullshit. This needs some time in the oven to bake. It's not ready to come out. And I, I, I totally agree with you in that. I think that's that's definitely something that happens day in, day out, week in, week out, where people snapshot something that looks good and then put their hand up as if they were sitting in class with the teacher. Hey, teacher, look at this result. Isn't it great? And they start to self-promote the fact that the decision to do CRO is a great decision and lacks that statistical significance of, of having enough data, enough throughput to make, make that really work. But I'm trying to be able to fathom out whether it should be the senior stakeholders and even perhaps the shareholders that need to understand that actually CRO is much more important than just a winning test because somebody said it was a winning test. Oh, yeah. Now, there I'm not going to disagree with you, but very few look it's business yeah. and business is about ROI and it's about and CRO the way it's been and I think this that's why you'll you'll hear a lot of voices I'm not one of them but you'll hear a lot of voices in the CRO community advocating pushing for a a renaming of CRO because it's misrepresentative mm -hmm. and a misnomer but but the way CRO has been sold the promise of CRO is you will look at your conversion rate curve and you will see it go up. Well, that won't happen because conversion rate, the one thing it does is it goes up and down. Yep. That's the nature of conversion rate. And you can do how much ever conversion rate optimization you can do, and it can be as solid as you can find. Your conversion rate will always go up and down. That's mm -hmm. what it does. But that's what people have been sold. And actually, you're right. What it is about, if if you look at experimentation, if you look at A-B testing, controlled online experimentation, randomized controlled trials, it is about learning stuff. It's about having an hypothesis. And so in the world of CRO, and this I fundamentally believe, this is for all the time I've been doing CRO, this has always been my fundamental belief, but it's hard to sell, is the following. We try to figure out the world of the customer. We try to understand the world of the customer. B, we come up with theories about how to improve the world of the customer. In other words, what are they trying to get done? Where do things go wrong? How do we get them to do it better? And C, we test those things in the real world. We validate those hypotheses, those theories in the real world. That's all about the customer. Everything I said there is about the customer. Nothing is about the business. But as soon as you get a business involved, then there's the customer perspective and the business perspective, and those two have to be reconciled. And that's where it becomes about money and things become fuzzy. I don't disagree with you. I think but there's a very fine balance that goes between money versus truth. And one of the things that we've always said is you're testing to learn, not learning to test. You need to be able to understand what you need to do to be able to do the right things. And you've got pressures from all places, the stakeholders, the shareholders, your boss, the fact that he doesn't really understand what CRO is. So you're trying to prove something that you've, you've made the right decision or help him to make the right decision. So it must be tough for a, for a, a younger, less experienced person without the kind of the knowledge and the experience that you and perhaps I and, and the guys that work in Web Trends Optimized have to be able to sit there and say, you know, I need to show that there is some sort of return on investment and that in a business is money in the bank. And that, that that's a really difficult dichotomy to face, especially as a, a young person. I wouldn't even say young, but an inexperienced person trying to do CRO because they obviously want to win. You know, I think, again, there's a lot there to unpack. Um, you use the word prove and we must come back to that because I think as soon as you try to prove anything in CRO, 
things start going wrong, you know, that's confirmation bias. And actually what I advise teams to do is the opposite. I say to them, when you run a test, try to prove yourself wrong because you probably will be wrong. Um, if you look at the stats and you look at how the world works, you are wrong more than you are right. You just don't know it. And so don't try and prove yourself right and don't try and prove anything to stakeholders. You, you're trying to prove yourself wrong, number one. And number two, stakeholders, the way to engage with them, and I have this conversation with teams regularly, not my own teams, but teams within organizations that we work mm -hmm. with and consult for, the way to deal with stakeholders, not just senior stakeholders, but your colleagues, people at the same level in other departments, is to sit opposite them, but be in the same cor corner and approach it just like you would a, like a CRO would approach a customer problem, which is what are you trying to get done in your life? And then how can I help you using CRO, the techniques, the tools, the system, the methodology? How do I help you to reach your KPIs and your goals? And, you know, so that reframes the conversation entirely. And then when we get to ROI, I think everyone is struggling with this. And the one thing I can say emphatically is there's no right answer for it. There are guys like Ben LeBay at Spiro has done some great work on this, and he's shared a lot of that into the community. Uh, he's not the only one. Um, there are others as well. One tool I don't want to mention because they, they're in opposition, but they've done some great work, um, got three PhDs to, to kind of look at millions of data points and come away with a sort of a formula. And so what that tells us is that you as an organization have to figure out a way to think about ROI that works for you. And that's what we've, we've done with all our clients. And some of our clients use different systems, systems that methodologies, formulas that work better for them or that have been co-created with them. And you can shoot a lot of holes through them, but that's always going to be the case. Um, the, the principle, the broad principles are that you, you know, we, we try to look at test span revenue as far as possible. So as far as possible, we try not to at all get into the game of forecasting revenue based on, you know, what we observed in the test. Because mm -hmm. as soon as you start doing that, you simply don't have data for it. You, you, you're starting to make perhaps educated guesses, yeah. but it's a guess. Um, but if you, if you want to go in that direction, you've got to apply all kinds of modifiers for things like um, decay over time. So over a period of months, that effect will disappear that you've observed. You've got to apply modifiers for things like interaction inf effect and uh, a, a false positive rate because some of your winners that you declared winners will actually be losers, but statistically – you know, you, you, you would miss them. And so you'd have to account for that as well. So if you're going to open that door on forecasting, you, you know, you've got to, you've got to try and build all of those um, fuzzy concepts into it. And it's not going to be the truth. Whatever the number you walk away with, the one thing I can guarantee you, that's not going to be the way it turns out. It'll satisfy the accountants. Yeah. You'll have a projection of how much revenue this test will generate in the next 12 months or six months or whatever your window, but it will be wrong. Let me just go back to that statement that we talked about, first of all, which is CRO sucks when it's not strategic. Um, surely there are many reasons why companies start CRO in the first place, whether it's to improve conversions or sales, as we would say, is probably the, the primary role that companies look at CRO and we've discussed the fact that CRO may not be the same phraseology and it does give a, um, an indication that you're there to be able to make that change in sales. But what are the other reasons that somebody who's at a stakeholder level can say, I I'm trying to sell this to my boss. Why should I go into CRO and how can I do that? That's going to deliver the results that is going to be manifested in some sort of monetization versus yeah. the we're just going to do things better. And I'd, I'd add this into it. How do we balance the customer experience versus the company KPIs? Oh, that's a critical one. 
I, I think that's a good place to start. I said this earlier that you have the customer perspective and you have the business perspective and you have, have to reconcile the two. And you've got to figure out how to do that. But, you know, often one of those voices is dominant. And we CRO practitioners pride ourselves in being the voice of the customer. But we do that so well that often we downplay the voice of the business. And not always, but often. And then you can say the same for business stakeholders, that they just think about their revenue and their margins and their KPIs and forget about the customer. And I've, I think you could even say, and certainly in my experience, that is more often true. So it's more often the case that business people will push their agenda without you know, being mindful of the customer agenda. But how do we combine the two? And, and one way to do it, it starts, it always starts with the customer perspective. It always starts with, well, as, as those words <laughs> come out of my mouth, I can challenge it. But in terms of the CRO process, right, you start by understanding the world of customer. You look at your analytics, you look at your heat maps, and you look at um, customer interviews and usability testing and survey results. It's, it's all customer data. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to understand what customers are trying to get done, where things go wrong, and how things can be better for them. And that's, you know, that's, that's the foundation. And then you, you formulate a hypothesis. So we believe doing X will lead to Y, and Y is effectively you know, the, the, how things are better. And then that hypothesis, this is, this is your first opportunity to bring those two together, to reconcile those two opposing viewpoints, custom and business, to say that... It'll be better for the customer because blank. Mm -hmm. And it'll be better for the business because blank. I, I must just say quickly, John, that this is a really important point to make. And it took me a long time to figure out how, how simple it is. When I look at many CRO programs, experimentation programs that... Um, where, where things are falling through the cracks and where there are symptoms and we start analyzing it, often you trace it right back to the hypothesis, to the hypothesis being weakly set up. And the, 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 there's a lot of guidance on how to set up hypothesis. There's one direct shortcut to Craig Sullivan's hypothesis toolkit I think it's on Medium, published on Medium. But if you Google Craig Sullivan uh, Hypothesis to Toolkit, you find it. And it is the most complete, most comprehensive um, hypothesis recipe that I've seen. And I've seen a lot and I've uh, created a lot as well myself. And that brings it all together. And I think that that's that's genuinely that's. How, that's where it all starts. That's how you force yourself to bring those two perspectives together. You have an hypothesis and you've got to think, how is this good for both business and customers? And you'll find, John, this is the last thing I'll say, you'll find that you have an hypothesis, you're playing with an hypothesis, and you can maybe justify it from a customer perspective, but you can't justify it from a business perspective. Man, that's a good place to be. Because suddenly you know you're not being strategic. You're moving shit around the page. <laughs> I love, I love that phrase. I think it's very, very, very good. I, I don't disagree with anything that you said. I think you're absolutely right. But I'm going to um, perhaps challenge a little bit with regard to what yeah, that is. Yeah, please do. Because I think that the people who are doing CRO are generally not major stakeholders. They are people who are perhaps a marketer who's been doing a lot of investigation and thinking he can he can become a champion inside the business and so looks to be able to enhance what he's doing on the website it could be from a web developer it could be somebody um, who's has more experience come out of university with an analytical perspective but they're generally not the people that are making the decisions they're people who are trying to be able to influence others to be able to make those right decisions and so therefore i, I find it almost chicken and egg how do you get the stakeholder to be able to do that if nobody's telling the stakeholder this is what the value is and the people that are apart from agencies like yourselves it's mm. difficult for somebody who's 
trying to do his best inside a business or her best inside a business to make those balances between the business and customer experience. So it's an easier sell to say, oh, we can do this. We'll get a return on investment. But if we spend X, mm. we'll get X times 10% or X times 15% or whatever it might be. Mm. So, and then what, what exacerbates that even further is if they do bite into that bait, then they start to be incentivized by their boss to be able to say, well, actually, if you get that, then we'll present this bonus to you. And so it becomes mm. monetized, not just in the customer experience and you know getting more sales, but actually the person that's doing it is then being incentivized to do the things that show the figures that actually reflect their potential for getting more bonus. So I think it's a really complicated um, it is very complicated. world in which yeah, we you're right. No, no, well, I won't disagree with that. I think you're absolutely right. The What I'm talking about is sort of Nirvana. And, of course, we don't work in Nirvana. You know, Nirvana lives in Johan's head <laughs> and nowhere else. But it, 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 knowing Nirvana, you, you will have seen the, you know, the maturity curve. Mm-hmm. You've got a – and there are various. I think there are seven at least that I'm aware of that have gravitas. But the basic principle is you've got to crawl before you walk, before you run, before you fly. Yeah. And Professor Stefan Tomko from Harvard Business School explains this beautifully. And I think is a, he has an entire chapter in his book. I um, can't remember the title. Experimentation Works. That's the title. And but, but these questions that you and I are talking about now very philosophically, everyone struggles with them. And you don't start in Nirvana on day one. You start in hell. And nothing works, and you know it's the, the, the two perspectives don't get reconciled, and we're getting everything wrong. We don't respect the statistics. Uh, our, our tests have bugs, and it's you know it's, that's you've got to start somewhere, and that's where you start. And then over time, as you climb the maturity curve, these things get sorted out, and some of these issues, the, the, like the fundamental ones that you've just touched on there, I think for many organisations they get sorted out very late in that maturity curve and that's okay we've got to say that to each other as well it's okay we evolve into a position like that the great thing this is going to sound like i'm selling agencies but it's it the the great thing of working with agencies or an experienced consultant is they've been there before if you've never been there before then even if you don't work with an agency or an experienced consultant, reach out to peers in the industry, like other organizations. I've been mind blown about how open teams are and how open even executive teams are about sharing knowledge with, with other organizations. Mm-hmm. I regularly facilitate um, conversations between my clients. Sometimes you could argue they are sort of more or less competitors. And they're happy to share knowledge and to, you know, where it comes to how they, in in my case, it would be how they approach experimentation and where they've done things wrong and how they've matured. So, So I think it's, my answer to your question is, yes, it's difficult. We don't have to figure this out on day one, as long as we figure figure it out. And if we work with others who have been there before, it will happen much faster. I, I think I've been in this industry quite some time and it's it's one of those industries where people are very open to sharing. I've been in the security industry where it's very, very closed. I've been in drug industry where it's very, very closed. This This industry that we're in today does like to share and does like to have an opinion. But there are now so that, many... Now, can I interrupt you? Yeah. Because and I think, John, that's a very important point. We have to stress that because we started off on a little bit of a you dragged me into that negative <laughs> spiral where we spoke about just how bad things are and how, how the youngsters are getting everything wrong. Um, and look, I, I made some horribly embarrassing mistakes when I started out and even when I should have known better. And I'm very happy to talk about those as well. And some of those were quite public mistakes the, but what you said there is important. So I mentioned the name Craig Sullivan earlier. Mm-hmm. Craig Sullivan is like a 
how would you, he's like a demigod in the industry, right? He's he's Mister Optimize. He's, he's been doing it forever, and he's 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 worked with anyone who's who's anyone, and he, he knows everyone, and, and he, he really knows his shit. That guy gave me so much time when I started out. I learned so much from him, not just directly, one to one, but also the free information that he put out there. Um, Pep, Pep's blog, CXL, you know, all that information that he, I mean, the, probably the school for most of us who started out 10 years ago, the CXL blog, and it was all there for free. Um, and right now that continues. So you've got people, A, putting information out there for free, good information, solid information that you can consume and, and learn from, but they also make time available. For what it's worth, I regularly have um, sessions with, uh, with people. They reach out to me on LinkedIn and I never say no to it. And whatever they want to know, I help as much as I can. I think there are people that are far better qualified to do it, but they, they happen to reach out to me. And everyone of those people that I speak to tell me the same story, which is that when they reach out to others like me who've been around in the industry for a, for a few years, nobody ever says no. They're all very open. John Ostrovsky, PJ, Positive John, he told me last week in London that he's done more than 200 coaching sessions yeah. with young people. I mean, that's, that's extraordinary. So I, I think that's a very important point you make is that people are very open to share and you've got to capitalize on it. And to those, the rest of us who haven't yet started doing it, let me tell you, it's the most rewarding thing. That's, that's what gets me out of bed. It's, you know, speaking to others in the industry and you'd be amazed also at how much you could learn from them. Like how much you could learn from people who approach you to, to be taught or to be mentored. I've learned, um, I've learned a lot from those conversations as well. So worth doing. Yeah, I, I think, as I said, it's, it's one of those industries that is very, very giving in its nature to be able to make sure that you know, other people learn and do, don't make the same mistakes that they did. But obviously we all know that mistakes are a good basis to be able to gain experience. Just don't make too many of them in, in the first instance. But, well, you're going to make a lot, and that's, that's not the problem. Making the mistake is, is not the issue. In fact... Uh, it's a mistake is if you not if you're not making mistakes then one of two things is happening one you're bullshitting yourself that's mo most likely the yep. case or you are just playing it too safe you're not growing and and if you make mistakes then that's a wonderful opportunity this is going to sound like 1960s hippie stuff but i'm going to spit it out anyway one of the darkest weeks i've had in recent years um, was I'll tell you the story. I was I was caught on the wrong side of a data breach, oh. and I I wasn't even involved directly. I was involved sort of on the periphery, but involved enough to you know have to answer for it. And this is about four years ago, and I spent a week sorting this out, and it was hell. I never want to be back there again. While I was in that dark period. I reminded myself every day, this is happening for a reason. And in a year from now, I'm going to be able to look back on this dark patch with some something to take away from it, some positive to, to take away from it. And that's exactly what's happened. I learned so much about respecting data and the processes that need to be in place and, um, you know, all the legislation. And it's instilled within me and with my within my team a discipline that wouldn't have been there had we not been through that before had i not been through that before so what a wonderful opportunity a minor data breach to grow into an area that's really important and that's the thing with mistakes or problems or you know whatever however you want to think about them it's an opportunity to grow and if you take that opportunity that's great mm -hmm. Good will come out of it. It's when you refuse to take that opportunity. That's when things, the wheels start coming off. Going back to our discussion a few minutes ago with regard to the maturity, and you said there's an evolution of you know being able to be 
great at CRO or whatever we decide to call it really surely part of that evolution is that CRO has to be tactical at some point in that mm. evolution and so yeah you can say actually if it if CRO sucks when it's not strategic but surely being tactical at times is part of that strategy would you not say oh it is yeah yeah absolutely it's, it's always tactical because you know what you do and and also my phrase moving shit around a page well mostly that's how CRO plays out even when it's um strategic so called so that but but the tactics it doesn't start with the tactics so one way to approach CRO and this is what i see a lot is you know deploy based practices um so that's tactical and there's no strategic link there uh, unless copying competitors you would regard as a strategy um the so 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 it's the the tactical bit isn't wrong it's what comes before it it's and what let me give you a, a sense of what i mean by strategic is perhaps seeing the the bigger picture um i'm trying to think of a of 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 an easy way to explain this it, we spoke earlier about the stakeholders maybe having a different perspective and you know how do you reconcile those two well that's that's where it all starts is as an organization what are we trying to get done and and what do we promise our shareholders and that's when we work with a new client then that, that's the first conversation in fact the, the first thing we do is if it's a listed company and often they are is read the annual reports mm -hmm. What have they promised to shareholders? Because if that trickles down to the various teams, and we've got to figure out how CRO at the very bottom, when you when you go through this waterfall of how KPIs trickles down, that's we've got to find how we plug into that. And 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 at a very simple level, that is strategic CRO is understanding how you plug into what the organization is trying to get done but it goes beyond that strategy is about the future it's about best practices is about getting to mediocre you could really say because if best practices work for you if you can blindly deploy best practices on your site and you get lifts from it that means you you were so bad <laughs> that you now mediocre and that's yeah. great that's a better place to be than where you were before that's not strategy strategy is about how we move into the future and with with experimentation what you can do is you can you can innovate you can oh what a horrible word you can figure out new ways of doing things ways that currently don't exist but it comes from a real understanding a proper proper understanding of something that a customer is struggling with and instead of throwing a best practice at it you you know you you come up with ways to to address that particular problem you test it you find it's wrong you learn from that why was it wrong what do we learn from it you test another iteration it's it doesn't work but each time you run that test and it's negative the problem doesn't disappear. The problem is still there. So you've just found ways not to do it, and it's taken you a step closer to, and that's where it that's where it becomes, um, in my mind, more strategic. We're getting pretty close to the end of this, but there's there's one thing that that I feel that probably needs to be aired is that we're trying to be able to educate people, and generally speaking we're not educating the people at the top it, in agencies it's, it's slightly different and I think some of the people and this is a huge generalization I apologize up front but it, in essence CMOs and digital directors have worked their way up through self-education they haven't mm. done a degree in whatever it might be they haven't come out with a um, you know a master's degree in this and even down to doing you know um, an MBA or whatever it might be doesn't include some of the stuff that we're talking about about delivering best practice for the business so i find it really challenging that companies not the the typical the a star companies you know the top times top 1000 or whatever it might be but those companies that are in the, the next level or perhaps the level before that are trying to be able to get their head round being strategic about um, cro 
for a CMO who's kind of stumbled into it because one of his underlings have said, you know, this is what you need to do, it seems as though that's a hard, it's a bit like pushing water up a hill, I should think. Do you think we as organisations need to be educating the CMOs of this world more um, to be able to realise that this is a business benefit as opposed to just a sales benefit? I think the answer is yes, but I think that's very difficult. And people don't want to be educated. You know, nobody goes to the office to be educated, especially not to be educated by somebody who perhaps report into them. Um, but the, but without a doubt, we've got to figure out a way to do that. And there are ways. And you know, whenever you, whenever you present a result, that's an opportunity to educate. Whenever you, but it starts with what I said earlier, before you run any test is to have a conversation with that CMO, with that director about, you know, what, what's keeping them awake at night? What would they like to be better? What, what? And then if you help them to achieve those goals, if you figure out how to use CRO to help them look better, then you're doing the right thing. And then the education that you'll need will land better because – you know, it's it's not like you, you you fight. It's not like you have to convince them to do things. Uh, as soon as you have to convince people to to do stuff your way, then um, well, no no amount of education is going to work. Johan, it's been a fascinating discussion, and I think it's it was a great topic to start with. But I think there's there's probably hours and hours of discussion we could have about different aspects of this. And I'd like to revisit that at some point, if that's possible. And again, asking for your help to to revisit it, maybe in two or three months or six months or whatever, because I think there's certain areas that that I know that you're pretty vocal on uh, LinkedIn, such as ChatGPT, etc., and how it would help versus not helping, etc. But for now, it's been great. I really enjoyed it, and I'd like to do it again sometime, if that's okay with you. Yeah, and if we talk again in a year from now, you'll find me give you different responses to the same questions. And you know, that's that's the nature of it. <laughs> I promise I'm not going to ask the same questions, but I think it would be certainly interesting, <laughs> to say the least, to find out how things have progressed over the intervening, intervening months. But for now, Johan, thank you very much for your time. It's been really great. John, great to talk to you. 